All right, let's go ahead and officially get started. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Alan Smith. This is the Consumer Reports Digital Wellness Webinar for the month of September. We're gonna be talking today about broadband and all sorts of broadband type things. Go for it, Kimberly, I was with you. Next slide is a great place for us to be. Um, we're gonna be talking about broadband and, and all sorts of broadband things and why we care about broadband, why broadband matters to us today. We're gonna get into a little bit of an activity about what, uh, about asking you some different poll questions and testing your knowledge. Uh, and hopefully we'll all learn something from that activity. We're gonna talk a little bit about what we can do to improve your personal connection and uh, tips and tricks for making sure that your internet is working as best as it can. And then we're gonna hopefully get to as many um, questions and answers as we can um, at the end with, with, with uh, everybody here. I'll try to get you out by uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, so in, in about one hour. Um, just a few quick things here. You know what, let's, let's not do the housekeeping things just yet. Let's just bring in our guests. So uh, go ahead, John, come off uh, camera here. So I've been talking a whole bunch. You all already know me, I'm Alan, but Jonathan Schwantes is joining us. Uh, John, tell us who you are, what you do at CR, and where you are right now. Great, thanks, Alan. This, uh, my name is John Schwantes. I'm an attorney for Consumer Reports in our advocacy di advocacy division. I'm based here in Washington, D.C. Um, I've worked in the Senate before, uh, early in my career. Also did some corporate work and joined CR almost coming up on my fourth anniversary. And I focus on tech and telecom law. Um, that's what I do. It's what I really love and enjoy. I know a little bit about how the technology works, but with the full caveat that I'm a lawyer and not an engineer. So, uh, but I'm happy and really excited to be here. Thanks, Alan. We're going to be working um, in the world of metaphor today uh, and try to keep it not too, too technical. We have a couple other people joining us from CR. Um, let's see if we can get Amira on. Amira, tell us who you are and what you're doing today with us. Hey all, pleasure to be with you. I'm based in New York and I work at Consumer Reports on our engagement programs. And for this call, I'll be in the Q&A helping answer some of your questions. And Kimberly. Hi everyone, my name is Kimberly Fountain. I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, based in our DC office. And I work in the mobilization department and I will be in the chat. Welcome everyone. Thank you. So that does uh, nicely set up the two ways that we hope that you can communicate with us. Um, there are the, there's the ability to chat, uh, and you've already seen a lot of people introducing themselves to everybody. And then there's the Q&A functionality where you can ask us questions throughout. I will uh, remind folks, and I'm seeing people have already done it, so whoever did that one upvote, you're awesome. Um, but in the Q&A, there's the function not just to be able to ask your questions, but to go and look at other people's questions. I would urge you to use that so that we, if, you, if there's one question that um, mo many people are asking, we can kind of deal with that in, as, as a one-off thing. Uh, Kimberly, next slide. So we'll do a few more pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, so not only do we have the um, chat and the Q&A, but we're also gonna have polls. Uh, these polls will hopefully be popping up right in the middle of your screen and we'll ask you some very simple questions. Um, if you don't get a poll, if a poll doesn't pop up, please don't worry about that too much. It's not going to be, um, you know, it, we're, not, we're not doing anything super scientific with these polls. It's just a way for you to play along at home. So I'll be reading out all the questions and answers as well. And so if you can't get the poll to work, don't fret. Just play along at home or write down your answers or, uh, you know, the points, we'll, 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 we'll give you points at the end regardless of how you do. Uh, a couple other things, we are only gonna get to an overview today. As John said, neither of us are engineers. So we're gonna be trying to give you a sense of how broadband works and what we can do to improve broadband, but we're not gonna be able to answer too many super technical questions. Um, ACT, which is my acronym that I made up for this particular uh, event, which is watch out for acronyms and terms. Um, we are going to be doing our best to not fire too many acronyms at you, but these things happen. And if we are going too quickly or saying acronyms you don't recognize, please ask us in chat or in the Q&A and we'll try to go back and check in on everything. Uh, one last thing or two last things, we are recording this presentation. We will be sending it around to absolutely everybody uh, after the event. So don't worry if things feel like they're moving quickly, you'll be able to go back and watch at your leisure. And please do uh, be respectful. We are um, here to learn, but, and we're also using the Zoom platform. So while I hope that 
we can, uh, you know, I hope this won't happen, but we, we know there's always a chance that someone comes in and is uh, going off the rails. We'll do our best to monitor um, that and uh, ask everyone to be respectful as much as you possibly can. So, John, uh, after all that housekeeping, we are here today to talk about broadband. Why should we care about broadband? Well, it, um, I think just by very nature of how we're communicating today via video conferencing, in this case, Zoom, uh, it requires an internet connection. And even before the pandemic, we have seen in the last 10, 20, 30 years, increasingly the way we live our lives, both for entertainment, both for work, both for school, medicine is increasingly using an internet connection to make that possible. Um, we've looked at this number, we've looked at it in CR. I know we're gonna get to some of our survey results of how often people use the internet every single day. I think that number is 82% in 2020, use it every day. Um, it's increasingly important. The pandemic has made that even more acute. Um, and it's a real question of how can we get better broadband internet? And what is broadband? Broadband, real simple, is super fast internet. Folks, uh, I'm old enough to remember when you dialed up into the internet, you'd get your little disc from AOL with your minutes and you'd use some strange modem and you had all the weird chirps and clicking. That was dial up internet. Then about 10 years later in the early 2000s, there was broadband internet, which just means bigger, faster, and an always on connection. It's kind of trotted out by the cable industry. And that's the standard today. And it's really what it is. And I think it's, it's coming up, we'll discuss it a little more. It's really just a measurement of speed of how fast your internet connection is. And the faster it is, the more you can do with your internet connection. And it's increasingly important. Um, like I said earlier, we're, we're working from home. I mean, for me, that was beginning of March um, and I haven't been in the office since. Um, kids are learning from home. I think for those on the call who have kids, I think they've all started school within the last couple of weeks. That's requiring an internet connection. And then, uh, you know, talking to your doctor. Um, if you don't feel comfortable going into the, into the the clinic, uh, we're all becoming very familiar with telehealth visits. And that all requires an internet connection. And um, the more of us that are using the internet, the more capacity we need for internet. Wonderful. So let's get to our very first poll or interactive moment for you today. Uh, we, John just told us why internet is important. So let's see if we can um, get to uh, how you are joining us today. How do you connect to the internet? Is it by your cable? Is it by a fiber connection? Is it a DSL connection? Is it a satellite connection? Um, are you using those uh, clicks and dings that John was talking about and still using a dial-up connection? We did this webinar on Monday. We did not have anybody joining us on dial-up. Uh, so I'll be curious to see if maybe this time we have one person who's joining us on dial-up. Um, let us know and again, if you don't see us popping up on your screen, that's not a problem. Just go ahead and uh, know for yourself, or if, if you're not sure, note that you're not sure about whether or not you know your, your own internet speed. So it looks like, again, um, we have a bunch of people on uh, cable uh, connection, more than, more than half of you, a few people who have graduated to fiber. Uh, again, uh, we have, oh, we have one person, one person who said dial up. Oh, that's interesting. Chat, chat me about what's your internet connection. Well, I'll be curious to see for the dial-up person what they are pulling down when we get to the speed test that's gonna come later on in this, in this event. And then for the people who are on other, uh, drop that in chat as well. What are, your, what, do you, what, 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 did we, what are you joining us with that we did not manage to enter here? Are you just on a cell phone? Um, how, are you, how are you joining us today? Uh, so thank you very much, appreciate that. And that will be uh, the poll device, something we're gonna go in a little, a little bit more as we go. But before we get to there, I want us to just nail down some terms so that we're all talking about the same thing when we talk about how the, uh, the, 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 the reality between how the internet, as pictured here by Al Gore, gets to your individual devices, the laptop, the computer, the iPad that you might be using in your home, your smart fridge, whatever that might be. So John, take us through just sort of like all the different things that have to happen to get the internet to you. Well, I see you have the inventor of the internet, uh, Vice President Al Gore. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, he did not invent the internet, but he, he was definitely a big champion of it in the 90s. Um, but no, those results didn't surprise me. Overwhelmingly in this country, it's a cable connection and fiber, which is 
pretty much rolled out by Verizon Fios services, a fiber optic, that's just an all glass connection. But by and large, with, with the exception of satellite, these are wired connections that come in from the company, the cable company, let's use that example. And it goes into your home and what we call the last mile. So that cable coax outlet on your wall, you, can, you know, for many, many years and still does video. It also does internet. And so you just kind of walk through this map and I like it because that last mile outlet, that's your interaction with your internet service provider, your ISP. And then you go back 20 years ago, there was a modem and then you would hardwire your modem to your desktop computer. Then about 10 years later, we decided, you know, wireless kind of frees you up, clears the cords, the clutter, and it makes you mobile around your house. And so that's where the router then was attached to the modem. And that's it had the little antennae and it would send the signal out in your small little, um, your little Wi-Fi network within your home. Um, nowadays, those are often combined into one advice. I mean, the, the cable modem router that I'm using that I purchased myself is a both router and a modem in one device and it creates a wi-fi network you, know, you password protect it so that's the thing when your friends come over i'm like hey what's your wi-fi password that's literally your wireless network that you've created in your home and uh you know, we'll, we can talk a little more details of what happens when more and more devices get on your network but this is just a good map of in a real simple oversimplified way of how the internet comes in from the outside world and the giant servers around the world into your home yeah, so when we talk later about different parts of this, uh, just keep this map in your in your mind's eye if you can, and we'll talk a little bit about you know different moments in the journey of the internet to you. But let's go ahead and, and pop to the next slide, Kimberly. Thank you very much. Um, so when we talk about broadband, uh, we're very specifically talking about uh, one thing, and it's actually uh, <laughs> sent to us by the FCC, right, John? Yeah, the, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they're based here in Washington, D.C. Um, they are the ones who determine what the definition for broadband is. And again, broadband is a speed measure in megabits per second. Um, they have last updated it, if memory serves, in 20, 2015 is when they boosted it up to 25 megabits per second download speed, three megabits per second upload speed. Because internet traffic is a two-way communication. Download, I mean, it's oversimplified, but when you receive an email, your computer is downloading that email. And then when you send your email, when I send it back home to my parents in Northern Wisconsin, I'm uploading that email and then it, they download it on the other end. Um, that's an important thing to remember. Um, so it's, it's really a measure of two-way internet traffic. Typically, we only really think of the download speed. That's what the ISPs advertise. And by and large is the more important speed, at least it used to be when you were downloading hundreds and th you know, thousands of songs from iTunes or what have you, you're downloading that and you're putting it on your device. But now that there's cloud computing and now that there's video conferencing, my video is literally being uploaded and you're all receiving it in a download. So upload is becoming increasingly important. But that's basically a speed measure. And there are a lot of advocates who believe that 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 speed right now, 25 down, three up, is too low and that they need to basically, you know, move it up, make it even faster, make it 100 megabits per second, for example. Uh, as we go to the next slide, yes, we, we, we are going to be talking a little bit about a couple of different parts of that further on. But specifically, I want to flag here that we are going to be getting into the, um, you know, how much speed do you need for different things? Uh, John mentioned it there for a second, but there are many different ways to defray the amount, <laughs> the broadband connection as it's coming into you. And so we're going to be talking about the different things you should be on the lookout for. But then it's not just, uh, you know, an individual person's connection. There are a couple of different things that go into a phrase that you may have heard before. We call it talking about the digital divide. Um, and you know, consumer reports, we, we really try to break that down into two categories within the digital divide. There's accessibility and affordability. Accessibility would be, can you actually get wires to your house? Can you get the thing that you need to be able to get online? And then affordability is self-explanatory. Can you actually afford the, the, the price or the price point that would allow you high speed access to the internet. Um, why do we, you know, why John, what should people think about when we think about the digital divide and, and why that's becoming maybe one of the important issues in 2020? Sure, I mean, this is, this is yeah, this is a very interesting policy discussion that's gonna be figured out, I would say, certainly in our lifetimes, the next 
couple of years, even more so as we're more and more increasingly reliant upon the internet, um, especially now in the pandemic, right? But imagine if you had no access to the internet and, or you couldn't afford it. You're a family on a budget, yet your kids are supposed to be online doing virtual learning. That's very, very difficult. And so it starts, it's something we're really thinking about and the internet right now is not really regulated. The FCC has kind of backed away from regulating it. So if you're a free market capitalist, that's great. Um, it's just a wild, wild west, just an unregulated, unregulated industry. But if we believe that actually it's increasingly important for people to have this, and we polled Americans, four out of five think it's as important as water and electricity. Well, those are regulated industries, right? So maybe at a bare minimum, everyone should have a connection or be able to afford a connection if they're going to participate in the 21st century economy and, and civilization, really. Um, and then, yeah, the numbers bear it out. Everyone's you know, 82%. That's up from 67% in 2017. And the average price of the internet is $66 a month. I mean, it's kind of, you know, that's, that's where it's at. The cable industry, now they call themselves internet service providers. They play some games. When you bundle your service, it seems like you're getting a good deal. And the minute you drop the video service, it seems like, wow, now my internet has gone up to 80 or $90 a month. I'm not advocating that we completely regulate the cable companies with when it comes to internet service, but I think there needs to be some bare minimum of, you know, is there a basic internet package that they should be required to provide so people can who can afford it can get online. And then also it's kind of more of a rural problem of there are just some parts of the country that don't have any internet service. And to be fair, is not it's cost prohibitive to wire uh, wire these homes much like we faced 100 years ago with electricity and with phone service and so a lot of the policy debates are around should there be some universal service requirements so everybody has access to the internet yeah so you know a couple of questions that um i think we're i think we will sort of break open a little bit more but uh i want to just sort of pose them now so john you get your your, your, your gears turning on them when we get to this this point later in the presentation, Philip was asking, will there be a broadband national program like the electrification program that you just referenced in the 30s for rural areas? Um, seems like there's not one on the immediate horizon, uh, at least not in the current administration or until uh, coming up right now. Is there any reason to think that that might be something we can get to? And actually, I, I posed that question, but then I want to put a pin in it. I promise we'll get back to that at a later point because I want to go on to the next slide for now. Uh, and uh, thank you for the question, though, Philip. It's, yep. it's an interesting it's one. It's a great question. Um, so all of the things that John just mentioned about the digital divide and about our accessibility and our affordability are obviously being heightened in this moment. Um, with the global pandemic, we are all dealing with a new reality when it comes to connecting to the internet. We're all working from home. We're all learning from home. Uh, many of us are learning from home and we're now more and more entertaining ourselves from home and trying to connect with others from home. Um, our home internet has not been built <laughs> with this in mind. Uh, it was built in the, with, with the idea that we would leave for eight to 10 hours a day and go somewhere else and use an industrial strength internet at work or at school. Uh, and one of the major problems with the, where, what we are facing in September 2020 is that all of the things that used to be going through multiple different networks are being rerouted to your home connection. So people are talking about slower speeds in the chat. People are talking about Netflix not streaming correctly. People are talking about all sorts of connectivity issues. That's always going to be heightened when everyone is at home using all of these networks for the first uh, at, at scale for the first time. Um, it is definitely true that some internet service providers, which we're going to start calling ISPs every single time as we go through here, acronym alert, some of these ISPs have been uh, stepping up to the table a little bit. They've been sending out mobile hotspots to uh, students who are trying to learn. Um, they've been dropping data caps so that more people can use more data than they have been previously thought that they were going to use. But there, there are still huge gaps in that um, net of connectivity. And Consumer Reports believes that we need to do a much better job of closing all of those gaps. Let's move now to... Um, our poll activity though, and we'll talk a little bit more, first of all, about the digital divide. So you should see coming soon to your screen, a poll question. Um, how many American students uh, are currently going into this year lacking adequate internet or computing devices at home? This is according to a Boston consulting study 
Um, but how many American students would you think lack internet or computing devices? So again, the digital divide can take many different forms. There's, do you have access to the internet? Do you actually have the device that is capable of processing that internet? Do you have a laptop at home? Do you have a, an iPad that can work correctly? Uh, how many do you think? Is it 5 million, 11 million, 16 million, 30 million, or are you just not sure? Let's see what you all said. All right, uh, there are a couple optimists in the group. A few, few people said just 5 million. Um, and it looks like the most people here, 42% of you said 30 million. It's actually 16 million. Uh, so 16 million Americans, and Kimberly, if you can take us to the answer slide here, 16 million Americans students uh, are going into this year without access to either the, the connectivity or the device that they need at home. So John, tell us about why that should be zero. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that just goes to Phil's question um, from earlier, which we'll get to. This number should be zero. Now, you know, that's maybe aspirational, but if we think about it like electricity or phone service, we're able to do that. We should be able to do this. Um, I think it's just very, very tough if students are staying home because it's safe during a pandemic to learn from home, but you don't have access to the internet, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? Um, I think you know, this has, this can be a bipartisan issue. This is something that usually gets brought up in the context of infrastructure bills, which typically when it's framed that way has more support from both sides of the aisle. But I think if we're gonna move forward and the internet's only gonna get more important, it's not gonna get less important, this needs to be a priority uh, for this country. To myself on mute. That will happen. All right, let's move to the next question here. So which of these are not something to worry about? We're moving away from access here and we're talking more about optimizing your own home Wi-Fi system. So which of the on the screen right now are not some Wi-Fi system works? Uh, is it the fridge? Is it your dog? Would it be the neighbors? Would it be the fish tank? Uh, or would it be something uh, that you're, or, or are you not sure about the answer to that question or the other? Um, that, you know, this is a little bit more tongue in cheek and we'll get into uh, kind of why each of the answers that are a problem are a problem. But what do you think is the one thing that is not a problem here on this list? All right, looks like 54% uh, of you correctly identified the dog. Um, now there's a caveat, the dog, if the dog has a, uh, a location chip, Maybe they do mess up with your internet a little bit. Or if your dog has an iPad, maybe it's a particularly advanced dog. Um, Kimberly, you can move on to the next slide there when you get a moment. But everything else uh, does in fact weigh in in some way or the other. So you've got your fridge. Uh, your fridge can be a problem uh, for two reasons. One, we often more and more people are buying smart fridges. So as you add more devices to your broadband connection, you're going to have more and more uh, uh, situations where you're, you're defraying, you have multiple different connectivity points. That's going to, to uh, divide your stream in different ways. John will do a better job of saying what that means better later. But the fridge physically is also a big metal object. Big metal objects affect Wi-Fi in some very real way. Um, that means that if you, if you have your router in one location and you're trying to use your device in another location, look out for large physical metal objects between you and that and that device. Also true for the fish tank. Uh, the fish tank and actually water is a big disruptor for a Wi-Fi signal. So uh, if you have a lot, you know, if you have one of those really sweet thousand gallon fish tanks, don't put your Wi-Fi router directly behind it. So the, uh, the and the last one there, neighbors, uh, and when we talk about the, the multiple inputs to your broadband system, so Don, tell us why what your neighbor doing actually really affects your... Sure. So if you have a router and you own your own, for example, you can go into the, adm the admin settings. <clears throat> and I've did this recently when I got a new cable modem router combo. And it's really, it's, it's just radio spectrum. It's basically channels that using either on the 2.4 gigahertz band or the 5.0 gigahertz band, 
can get back to that in a second. But those bands are split up into channels, much like if you're tuning in old FM or AM radio. And what I'm allowed to do when I log in as the admin on my router is I can see which channels are being used because Wi-Fi is limited in space. It only really goes out anywhere from 30 to 50 yards, depending on what kind of setup you have. But it, it, the default's kind of, the, the channel's kind of default to whatever. But I looked into it like, hey, it's kind of slow and, you know, it's all privacy protected. But you can see there are 10 users on a particular channel within um, the available channels. Just move your device to a different channel within that, uh, within that setting. Uh, but yeah, because it's, you know, I'm, I'm in a big apartment building. So yeah, I pull it up. You can do it when you do it on your device. You'll see all the available broadband or uh, Wi-Fi networks. It could be a dozen or more sometimes. I mean, that's a lot of traffic within a small space. Now, granted, everything's discreet and it's encrypted for you and your use only and your families. But sometimes just even moving to a different channel can give you a little boost of capacity and speed. All uh, right, let's move on to the third and final poll question for us today. Uh, so, as far as you know, uh, without looking at your bill, without going back and checking your internet speed right now, what internet's download speed do you think you're paying for? Are you paying for something that advertises at 25 megabits per second, 25 to 100 megabits per second, 100 to 250 megabits per second, or something that's greater than 250 megabits per second. Also, I appreciate that we've got some folks who are sharing their first internet connection speed in the chat. Uh, really looks like people were talking about some very slow, uh, there, was no, there was no capital M in front of some of those numbers. Um, this is, this is a, a, a major, people are paying for what they think that they're paying for, not necessarily what they think that they're getting. Uh, all right, so looks like, uh, interesting. So we have a pretty, a pretty good, um, a pretty diverse group here. Most of you are in the 25 to 100 megabits per second range. Um, that's interesting because I say that's interesting because last time uh, the preponderance of people, I think, John, were in the 100 to 250 range. So this is like a slightly less wired uh, crew. So that's just an interesting, an interesting uh, observation there. But what the the that's what where people are, are are currently paying for, not necessarily what they're getting. So let's try something a little bit new for us here. Um, Kimberly, if you take us to the next slide. Why don't you everyone take a moment to run a speed test? Now, there are two ways you can do this. Uh, you can go to Google's homepage and type in speed test, and then use the very first thing you that pop up pops up there. It's a blue box. It says run speed test, or you can go to speed.measurementlab.net. Now we're asking you to use a very specific kind of speed test. MLab uh, is a nonprofit. They don't have a finger on the scales. They have no vested interest in whether or not your broadband is performing well. They're just gonna do an objective speed test. Uh, a couple other caveats. You're gonna find that your speed may be a little bit lower because you're on this webinar. So uh, obviously Zoom is using up some sort of channel and you may have a bunch of other stuff running. If you wanna get a truly objective speed test, you really should close everything out and uh, uh, start from scratch. Don't do that right now. Stay with us, don't leave. But uh, go do a speed test and let me know in the chat what you're getting. Uh, I will also say for folks who are worried about navigating away from this webinar, don't worry if you don't wanna do a speed test right now. We'll send you these links after the fact and we'll be happy to, um, you know, you, you, can, you can test to your heart's content at a later point. But John, as people, actually Kimberly, go to the next slide, and as people are starting to running, run their speed tests, um, what are these numbers? What are people getting back here? It looks like uh, 27 down and 5.43 up. Um, or you can see on the screen right now, or you can see on the screen right now what the speed test might look like for you. But um, what are people seeing here? Well, with, keep in mind that the, the definition of broadband is 25 megabits per second down, three megabits per second up. And the upload speed for video conferencing is, is equally important, if not more so. But um, the ISPs, and I, you know, it's, it's what they do, really want to, they, they, they plan, they advertise their plans in different speed tiers. And, you know, I'm, I'm prone to it as well faster sounds better so if i can afford it i'm going to go with the fastest plan i can afford 
But the reality is you don't need a lot of speed to do basic things. It depends how many devices you have on the network. But I want to say to do HD TV, like streaming video from Netflix, it's, I forget, eight megabits per second is roughly what you need for 4K, which is a much higher resolution of TV picture. You're going to need more, like 18. But by and large, if, unless you have like a dozen devices on your network, you can get by with 25 megabits per second. The problem gets in when there's network congestion, how many neighbors, how many devices you have in your home. So yeah, it'd be better to probably have 100 megabits per second um, if you can afford it. Um, but yeah, right now- well, Go ahead and hit the next slide as we go here. Yeah. Because you'll see uh, one, one such test, which was my test last Friday night, um, which was, as you can see, not really fast enough for uh, some of the things that John is mentioning. Um, and I'm actually seeing even a couple lower numbers as some people are testing in the chat. So I assume part of that is because you are on this webinar. So there's, this is what's left over. Um, but go ahead and take us one more slide here, Kimberly, because I wanna show you all something that John was just talking about. And this is a little, this is one of the different uh, ways to slice how much speed you might need. But as, as John was saying, to get to 4K um, high definition video streaming, this is all for video streaming. So for 4K video streaming, you might need 18 um, megabits per second. And that's again, assuming that yours is the only connector trying to run 4K at a time. Uh, HD is closer to eight. Uh, any kind of SD standard definition video is one. So if you're pulling down one right now, you're probably not seeing John or I in our crystal clear, most precise, uh, beautiful picture, but you are at least seeing that we exist and that we're blobs on your screen. And then to get music, you were talking about less than a megabyte. So uh, that's, that's one, uh, one sense of that there. But there are a couple other questions that you should be asking yourself when you think, how much should I be paying for? And again, we're only talking about paying for it here now. We haven't gotten into the, the sort of what you're actually getting and whether or not um, that's enough. But uh, some questions to ask yourself, um, how many devices do you have that are regularly connected to your home internet? Are you a smart household in which there are thousands of things that are pinging your router at any given moment? Or are you like me and John and you've sort of fled from the smart device revolution to the point that it's really only just your, your, your computer and maybe one or two other things? Um, how many people are using the internet simultaneously? Are you at home uh, trying to watch something by yourself? Or uh, do you have a teenager playing Worlds of Warcraft uh, in one room and another uh, kid taking a, a, a virtual PE class in another room? Um, and, and, and how much are those things uh, uh, drawing down simultaneously or, or at different moments? Um, John, what am I what am I missing here from sort of how people should be thinking about what they pay for? Well, it's it's um, definitely how many devices are connected to the inter internet, but also what is the application? Um, when you're sitting watching Netflix, it's through a live internet connection that's streaming that video to your television set, and that requires some bandwidth, which is what you're paying for, uh, measured in megabits per second. Um, but it, and not all applications are created equal. If you're just sitting at your computer reading emails, that's a very low intensity activity. It's gaming, multiplayer games, which is you know in real time, quick button motions, playing a game at the same time somebody halfway across the world is playing with you. Um, that's a very dynamic, requires a lot of bandwidth, especially if you're playing in 4K. Um, it's just, that's, that's just a way to think about what are you using the internet for in exactly your second point, internet simultaneously? Uh, when we both, my wife and I worked from home in March, we quickly realized like we're not, we don't have enough bandwidth. I realized I had a 10 year old modem router. It was time to upgrade because it wasn't having the range both in the condo and it wasn't enough bandwidth to, to both of us to be on video conferences all day long. Um, but yeah, that's the biggest takeaway here is, and I think it's really just doing a self inventory of what's really on your network. You can check again, you can go in the admin settings of your router, you can see all the different devices that are connected, but um, just make sure some of those can run in the background. Like right now, my PlayStation 4, yes, it's connected to the internet, but it's off. It's not doing anything. It's just lying there dormant, not sucking up any bandwidth. Right. Uh, I did see one question. This is from Department of Acronyms or, or things sure. that are going too quickly to clock. Um, one of the things that came back in the speed test 
um, was that uh, uh, what is latency and what is it, what does it affect on the consumer? Because that's one of the things that gets popped out in that speed test. What does that number mean to people? You want a lower latency um, is the first thing. And it, it's really just how quick you're pinging things and how quickly your broadband connection, like how agile is it? And so when you're pulling something down from Netflix, yes, the speed's, it's, the speed's important, but how often, it, how quickly can it just keep that bit stream going and keep it from buffering? But buffering was, it still happens today, but we might remember first streaming video back in the day, like 10 years ago, you're watching Netflix and you'd get the wheel. And it just spins, 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 because it's trying to catch up. It's trying to keep the data coming in. Latency just keeps it moving along. So if you think about a treadmill, it's just motoring, motoring, motoring. It's not slowing down. Great. Okay, so let's move into, uh, and I appreciate the questions that are coming in. And I also appreciate Amira's speed and diligence in answering them. Keep up the great work, everybody. Um, but don't forget that you can find someone else's question. You think it's an interesting one and upvote it. Um, rather than rather than just asking it again and again. Um, so setting up your home internet system, when we talk about, so then now we're talking about sort of the last couple steps, if you remember that initial uh, diagram. We've gone from ISPs, we've gotten it into your house, and we're talking about sort of like setting up a Wi-Fi system. Uh, we have a couple pieces of advice for people, but the first one is um, don't rent the, the ISP, the internet service provider router. Go ahead and, and, and buy your own. Um, and we'll talk about how to how to then optimize your Wi-Fi from there. But John, why why um why not use what they give us? Well, I mean, it could be perfectly fine. Um, and certainly, if you're if you're at a really high speed, like I think 400 megabits and above, you're unless you buy your own router that's configured for those sorts of speeds, you're probably going to have to take the modem from the uh, cable from the cable company. Although not necessarily, the biggest thing when you buy your own cable modem and router is before you go to you know before you drop anywhere from 100 to 200 dollars on that make sure it's compatible with your cable company's network by and large they are but sometimes they're not so that's usually you have to suffer through a phone call with a customer service representative to make sure they're supposed to allow you to interconnect any modem of your choice to their network we've seen a lot of things in the market where they're playing games saying you have to take their modem or their router we worked on passing a law last year that will go into effect later this year that would say enough is enough. You do not have to have, you do not have to rent a modem router from the cable company. You can go buy your own and connect it. So if you're in a position where you can afford to do that, you're going to save yourself anywhere from what used to be $5 a month. Now it's closer to 10, 11, $12 a month. Within a year, you'll probably already pay for that modem. So go ahead and buy your own. And that, and that allows you to really look at some features. You want to get like a dual band, one that operates on two different bandwidths, 2.4 gigahertz and 5.0 gigahertz. 2.4, I mean, that's the modem router I have. It's off to down behind me to the right. Um, 2.4 tends to have more range, so that can cover a, a larger part of your house, whereas the 5.0, by and large, 99% of the time will always be faster the 2.4 gigahertz band that's a real practical advice you want to definitely get that kind of modem router uh, optimize your wi-fi definitely centrally located in your home as best you can don't put it way off in some guest bedroom down in the basement that's it's literally truly a radio thing think about it as an antenna um, also if you're really struggling or you don't have a very fast connection and you're kind of stationary like i am and you're at a desk i'm on my laptop right now but i'm an old school desktop sitting at a desk just wire the thing. You can still do that from the modem. Take an Ethernet cable and stick it in the computer, and that will always be typically very reliable and faster than Wi-Fi in most cases. Definitely go on your devices. We've covered that. And what do you do? I mean, that's try those steps first. And if there's a problem, then you're either not you're getting either a wiring problem in your home. Definitely newer wires better than an older wire situation. I mean, I've had friends who literally the cable wire is hanging off the side of their row house and they're like, ah, that's a problem. That's, that's like an old school problem of that wire is probably a little frayed, for lack of a better word. And that will affect your performance of um, the network. And then I want to just, uh, I've seen some people throwing this into chat, but go ahead and drop into chat, um, you know, what you all do. What have you, what have you found that works to, to, to mess around with your Wi-Fi? Um, you know, you can ch changing the channel, trying to find changing channels between two, 2.7 and five. Is that right? 2.4 and five. 
two point four and five. Uh, have you have you played with other things that have uh, managed to make your Wi-Fi feel more effective? Um, a couple people have been asking us questions in here about mesh Wi-Fi or uh, Wi-Fi extenders. Mm -hmm. If you think about, as John mentioned, the um, the 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 single router as a as a radio signal that goes in a globe around that uh, router, assuming you don't have you know fridges or fish tanks in the way. Uh, you can think of the extenders as smaller uh, uh, radio stations that are taking that signal and broadcasting a little bit further. Uh, mesh is a fairly new technology uh, that we're just starting to review at Consumer Reports, but uh, the mesh technology is essentially a series of extenders that talk to each other very well um, and that do a good job of transferring you from extender to extender so that it's a seamless process to say, uh, pace around your house whilst watching a soccer game. Hypothetically, yeah. I'm not saying I do that. Um, so let's, uh, and, and then, you know, okay, so now we're at the point in the, uh, the, the, the broadcast in the webinar where we get to get back to Philip's question. Um, and he's actually asked another question, uh, is broadband like healthcare or right for all citizens? But then I also want to throw out here another question I saw from Peter Marcus. Um, is there any federal legislation pending that could impact either broadband speed or access to broadband, John, because as we see on the slide right now, internet services are currently wildly unregulated and it is rather like the wild west out there right now. Yeah, they're, they're, it, it, I mean, it's very different between the House and the Senate right now, but the House has passed several packages as part of what, whatever is gonna happen with the fourth COVID relief package. Um, but there are measures in there, I think, is both in the infrastructure bill the House passed and as well as what I think they're calling the HEROES Act, which is their fourth relief package um, that would invest, make huge investments into broadband, both on the accessibility side and the affordability side. I think one of the more intriguing options, and it kind of goes to Phil's question from earlier, $100 billion to build out the infrastructure. And this is both incentives for private industry and others to send you literally get bigger, better, faster internet in more communities. And it's gonna take that level of investment. And I think some combination of government support and private enterprise and where that doesn't work, you can see communities have set up their own networks. One of the, in CR's um, telecom survey, Chattanooga's municipal broadband or what we call community broadband, kind of like if you think of an electric co-op, for example, run by the county or the city, that's run by the city of Chattanooga. Um, they compete with the cable companies, but, um, they're, they get some of the highest ratings in our survey. Uh, but yes, those proposals are out there. I think, you know, having worked in politics for far too long, it's hard to imagine something happening before the election. That's kind of the conventional wisdom that they don't pass a lot in election year, but this is an unprecedented year. So I remain hopeful. And that's certainly something we're advocating um, at CR is for a stronger both infrastructure investment and then where people are affected, you're laid off because of the pandemic or you just can't afford internet for a variety of reasons. There's no fault of your own. Some sort of government support for folks to be able to get online uh, in the form of a, a short-term emergency benefit. But it's gonna take more. This is a long-term project. There's no quick fixes. I think if you think about the phone world, you think about the electric world, there's gotta be some sort of build-out requirements and it's gonna take an investment. All right, and then Kimberly, if you move us to the next slide, um, we also wanna talk about sort of uh, if, it, if it's not uh, long term, um, what we can all do right now. So um, I'll start by saying that when we send around the um, the follow up email to this, and in fu future, fu coming too soon to a theater near you, we're hoping to have ways to go through consumer reports to do these things. So we can connect you maybe directly to the legislative body or the individual ISP that you can complain to. But uh, do complain. If you are finding that you're paying for 250 megabits per second and you're getting seven, you're getting 24, something regular where you're speed testing and it's not even close to what you think you should be getting, complain to the FCC or complain to your state's version of the FCC, whether that's the state AG or uh, sometimes it's called a state public service commission or a public utilities commission. Uh, it's also probably worth it to complain to your ISP. Uh, sometimes they can actually do things that help and other times it's good for them to know that you're paying attention and you're not just letting it gloss over because you, you need the service. Um, 
And I think that the last thing that we have on here that I think is very important is to make public that complaint to the ISP. You could imagine uh, tweeting or Facebooking, if those are things that you happen to do in your personal time, a, a, a picture of your speed test uh, to let people know that you know you've been testing and looking, and it's not even getting close. And maybe tagging Comcast or tagging uh, your your um, your your public uh, a, a public version of the PR version of that company. So uh, I think some folks are asking in, in chat, you know. How do you complain to your ISP? They do everything they can to make it difficult to contact them. Yes, they That's do. That's true. It's, it's but you can exercise. also go to the public forum. It's an, ex it's an exercise in patience. Um, and I've done it, it seems like every year, it's an annual tradition to get them on the phone to keep your, promo your promotion extended to keep your prices down low. And I also wanted to respond, I saw, you know, I had to put on my readers. Uh, Roman made a great point. The ISPs have actively gone around to states and passed laws to prohibit municipalities from doing their own broadband or where they have built it from extending it out in the community. And I just want to assure Roman that we have work, we are working on that issue. It's a tough nut to crack, but we oppose those sorts of laws that the ISP support and we do support uh, smart, cost-effective municipal broadband. All right. So like I mentioned, yeah, go ahead and go to the next, the next page. We, we, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, we, we managed to get a few of these scattered throughout. Um, let's see here. Let's, let's go with the first question here. Um, uh, Robert asks, how do you, how do recent FCC rules change, rules changes relative to net neutrality impact us going forward with such increased reliance on internet based communications? This is maybe couldn't be more in your wheelhouse, John. I was going to say, if I, if I, yeah, I've spent many years <laughs> on neutrality. Um, it's, the, it's the gift that keeps on giving, and I'm being sarcastic. No, um, they did repeal most of the net neutrality rules in December of 2017. Um, and in so doing, within that, and I don't want to turn this into law school, but uh, they, they deregulated internet service from what was considered a telecommunications service, which has all kinds of protections, non-discriminatory access, net neutrality, meaning the ISPs can't block or slow down traffic or set up pay prioritization lanes or, you know, it, it was by and large, and, you know, people can disagree on this, but CR has long been a supporter of strong, effective net neutrality rules because we believe they ultimately help consumers. Um, but yes, with buried within that many hundred page order from the Federal Communications Commission was this deregulate this deregulation of what we call broadband internet access service. And I think we're seeing the real practical effects about it. No matter how you might feel about net neutrality, deregulating the internet has effects. So when FCC Chairman Pai did the connected pledge back when the pandemic began, he had no real authority other than to ask them to do it. So Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, they just voluntarily decided to do nice things for consumer. There was nothing that FCC Chairman Pai could do to force them to do that. Um, and I think, you know, that's the sort of the policy questions that we think about every day at Consumer Reports, but we think if you regulate them in a light touch way to require certain levels of service, require to actually deliver the speeds that people are paying for. I mean, we got involved in some litigation in New York State where a charter doing business as Spectrum simply lied about the speeds they were offering consumers, mm -hmm. advertising 101, and uh, they ultimately settled. But that's the sort of thing um, that I think just a little bit of regulation would be good for, good for consumers. And that's my opinion. That's Consumer Reports' opinion. Um. So I'm gonna ask for two things to happen now. Kimberly, could you go to slide number seven? I know that's not in any way part of our current plan, but I wanna go back to slide number seven if that's at all possible. And then I'm gonna read one more question while we're getting there from Sue Gold. Um, one thing that concerns me is that, the, is that we pay about three times the price at my husband's office for half the speed that we get at home. Uh, I teach on Zoom, so it's essential for me, but my husband is a doctor and has to use the internet for, the, for there and, um, and telemed and things like that and is slow and often goes down? The answer is home is completely different from business. Um, so how, like, uh, I, guess, I guess that's not exactly a question, but do you have a reflection on, uh, you know, different speeds despite paying a lot more for a, a, work, a work connection? Um, so I just to make sure I understand it correctly, I, if I understand correctly, the work connection is much faster and reliable than the home internet connection. Uh, Sue should clarify that, but I think it's actually the reverse in this case. 
Well, that's, that's that's not often we hear that. Um, I would wonder what they're running at the in the office environment, um, because typically those tend to be commercial applications with much larger servers and and typically fiber, fiber optic. Um, but yeah. So uh, I think that the reason why I put us back to slide number seven then is to see if we can uh, answer a couple questions that I saw popping up. Sure. Um, People are saying things like, I don't understand or know how to change my internet. Um, you broke up then, Alan. Oops. Well, see, this is, I need faster internet speed. This is always <laughs> a problem. The reason why I'm here is to see if, uh, John, you could take us again through, so like each of the recommendations that we've given you about routers or Wi-Fi's and how they, um, reflect back to this picture. So when you talk about changing your internet speed, you're probably talking about calling up your internet service provider, right? That's typically, that'd be my immediate response is if you could go online just because you know, with few exceptions, calling a cable company is an exercise in patience, but um, you can see what speed tiers they offer. I mean, again, they typically have better deals for new consumers than they do existing customers. That's a, a long-standing complaint about the cable industry. Like, you know, they entice new business, but for existing customers, uh, those deals don't apply. But that's typically the first thing um, is see what plans they have out there. They really hate losing customers, especially whether you have, if you have, if you're lucky enough to have choices within your neighborhood or your building, uh, they typically will send you to a retention, spe retention specialist to keep you subscribed. They don't really want to lose you as a customer. Um, but yeah, typically in my experience, you should call up, you kind of see what you're dealing with and cause they'll change the way they market these speeds. Typically every year they kind of change them, you know, like, well, now we're going to do a 100 megabits per per second plan. Just that's their marketing folks figuring out how they want to package these services. But that's typically the first thing you need to do. I know Kimberly is really fond of using the chat function when you go online. So log into your account, let's say it's Comcast, log in and then just deal with the chat because typically they have some sort of freedom to give you a better deal. Um, worst case scenario, get them on the phone and see what they can do. Um, but sometimes, you know, in you know, best case scenario, you will get higher speed for roughly what you're paying now. It just happens to be they they redid their plans. So that that's the first that's the first um, I don't know bulb on this little graph here. But then we're also we also gave you some advice about Wi-Fi stuff. But then the router specifically, the modem router combination. That's when we were talking about you know if if it's an old router, if this is a device that you've had for a long time, go ahead and and spring for a new one because that might be one of the things that's really slowing down the, uh, you know, that might be sending you a signal that could be a lot faster than what your modem or router can handle. Um, and that's when John was talking a little bit about making sure that your router is one of their, one of the ones that's on your ISP's okayed list. Um, and I, I see, I see that you want to jump in here, John, go. Well, yeah, no, I guess it's a real practical matter. Um, Cause I went through this at the beginning of the pandemic. Yes, it's a speed issue with the router, but it also could be a range issue. And the easy way to test, and I saw a few things come up in the chat, get on your mobile device, run the speed test, but run it near your router, okay? And then go into the bedroom or a different part of the house that's a little bit further away from your uh, modem router. And you're, you should see that speed drop off. And if it drops off like a lot, that's a range issue and definitely a new router modem combo might improve the range. The range has gotten much better uh, again on a dual band uh, type of modem router. Increasing your range typically will increase your speed, at least within your home. Great. And then the final kind of piece of this visual, when we get to the Wi-Fi mesh, all that sort of stuff, seems like people on this webinar are really uh, wanting to know a, a practical recommendation for whether they, they should do those things. Um, the problem, unfortunately, with uh, diagnosing each individual case of Wi-Fi is that it really does, and this is not a satisfying answer, I know it's not a satisfying answer, but it really does depend on who, who you are and where you are. Um, are you someone who likes to have all of your, are you, do you only use your computer in your office? Are you someone who has a very large home and likes to wander around? Um, if, if you can, 
we, we always recommend actually plugging something into actually wiring something, wiring it up if that's a, if that's an option. But you know, my my current laptop doesn't even have wires, doesn't even have that connectivity. So the questions you should be asking yourself are around the, along the lines of uh, how do I use the internet and uh, am I running am I running into problems where I'm walking too far away or am I running into a problem where it just feels like it's too slow? Uh, it depends a lot on on your particular use case. But John, I will throw one particular use case to you just to see what you what you recommend. This particular user, Kelly, has two phones, four laptops, one desktop, one smart TV. We use Zoom on at least two or three devices simultaneously because the kids are at home and everybody uses YouTube all the time. What are we talking about? Like a minimum purchase for that particular configuration of users. I mean, that's, a, that's I, should, I wouldn't even say that's a lot. That sounds like, you know, very standard. But yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's a lot of devices. And so this is where we run into the problem. So first of all, I'm going to give her an answer. I'd say 100. It's just looking at that, I'd say 100 megabits per second is kind of where I'd feel comfortable operating if she's, you know, depending on kind of like, what does she have now and how is that working out? What kind of modem router setup she has? Those are sort of the next level questions I'd want to, want to ask her. But just looking based upon that, assuming she has a cable or fiber connection, I would bump up to 100. And, you know, because the cable companies want to get you, they want to sell you more. If you can afford it, 250 should solve all of your problems without even breaking a sweat. But that's just, I mean, I'm not saying that because she needs 250, but that's typically how the cable companies break in the tier. They kind of have like a, you know, bare bones tier, then they kind of have something in the 100 range, and it's 250, and then it gets kind of crazy, 500 and above. Uh, but I would say 100 should, should be a pretty steady, reliable speed for her. Great. So uh, before I ask Kimberly to take us to the very last slide, and I'm about to do that, I will just say one more time that this visual, uh, every step of this, something can fall apart. So we talk about optimizing. Um, yes, changing your Wi-Fi can at times have uh, minor changes. Um, changing your modem, getting a new router can have minor changes, but if your ISP is not sending you or is not giving you enough bandwidth, even if it's not giving you what you pay for, then it does become a question of legislation. It does become a question of uh, going to the FCC or going to the attorney general of your state, because at some point uh, we, can, we can mess around in the margins only so much. And if the ISP is not living up to the set uh, um, recommendations, that's what it is. All right. We are just exactly at the hour. So let me uh, take us to our thank you page. Uh, and then I want to just give, let everyone know that we will be following up with an email. There will be links in that email with everything that we mentioned in the chat, including um, our router buying guide, including some information on um, the different uh, suggestions that CR has for how to set up those different things and, and to customize them really for you. Um, there'll be a recording that we send around of this webinar so you can go back and get information out of it that you think you need. And last but not least, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, community at cr.consumer.org. That's community at cr.consumer.org uh, should be the best way to, uh, to reach out to John and I and Kimberly and Amira and we will do our best to, to get back to you and answer your questions there. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for your questions, for your engagement, for the wonderful suggestions that you all share with each other in chat. Um, and we really appreciate all of your time and energy and look for the follow-up information uh, from us uh, sometime tomorrow. Thank you all and have a great rest of your afternoon.